question that came in through our Q&A, a written question. Um, I'll be really curious how you guys respond to this. How do we thread the needle between the slogans of Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter? Is there an integral way of actually bringing these two together? I mean, you know, often these are kind of presented as opposites. You know, All Lives Matter is typically used as a way to deflect from Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. But I've actually seen a few sort of uh, more savvy conservatives relate to this a little bit differently and actually make a decent case for um, what they mean by all lives matter. Um, and they apply it to things like police brutality, for example. The militarization of our police is something that is affecting all ethnicities, white people included. And it is clearly an important part of this story that we're seeing erupting in 150 cities around the country. Um, so how do you guys sort of relate to those two, to those two slogans? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I first. have a very, can I interrupt first, you guys? Okay, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, I just have to direct. Yeah, typical that is. I think a typical white person. <laughs> can I, I white just have to direct thing? everyone to my guys cafe. trying to talk, you interrupted. <laughs> It's not that I don't want to hear what you have to say, but I just have to say Michael Che has captured this the best. Have you guys seen it? No. Michael Che. He basically says it's like saying to your woman, you know, like she's like, you know, I, you know, do I matter to you? You know, and he says Baby, basically to her, well, all women, all women, all women, women matter. matter to me. It's like, no. <laughs> don't do it. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know. If, you know what? I might be done. That's a mic drop. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. You can't, if you haven't seen him on YouTube, ch check it out. It's awesome. That, that, anyway. that is, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's uh, kind of in the spirit of that. It's, it's the skillfulness of allowing someone that is having an experience to have that experience. What I've noticed is in the dominant culture, the, the, the pain of acknowledging this, I think this is where the deflection comes from. So what helps for me is to understand where the deflection comes from. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's the skillful, or I should say, in most of the time, unskillful usage of all lives matter um, as a, an immediate, Corey, as you said, a deflection point. And I, again, I try to bring things down to my own personal experience and convey that in conversations to people. When I hear these things, it's, it's, if someone's conveying and opening up to you, sample person or sample conversation, about a very traumatic experience, is the first thing out of your mouth, well, that happened to me too. You know, or, well, in the sense of diminishing and not allowing space for that person to experience, that person's personal trauma or personal experience. And so I think it's just even kind of bringing that sentiment down to what we consider just really good decorum and the way we treat each other. We all know from personal experience that when someone is opening up and being vulnerable, we let them be vulnerable. We know that in our individual personal experience. Why is that then different? at a macro societal level. And so it's just sort of, I think, drawing this micro to macro parallel of, hey, you let someone you care about and that you love have to open up and have this vulnerable experience. And so in that way, that's what we, that is the movement of, of what we want to have at this macro level. As black people are saying this, this is our pain. This is our pain. And I think you're starting to see it. I think you're starting to see a lot of folks say, you know, maybe, th maybe we should actually listen instead of just immediately going, oh, well, well, well all lives matter. You know, I don't want to deal with that pain. So, so I'm seeing this parallel between what, how we do things and what we consider uh, culturally uh, good etiquette in terms of letting somebody open up and listening at that level. We're sort of taught that. We're taught, we're taught that even in professional levels about listening, the importance of listening. We need to do that at a societal at a more macro level as well. So they used to call it good manners, man. Good manners, man. Yeah. Good manners. Yeah. 
Good, my, my folks in the South call it good home training. You know? Good home training. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would say, I would say that you know, there's a there's a thing with logic. That's one thing. So, if all lives matter, that means that Black lives matter too, right? All lives matter. Mm -hmm. okay. So that that move to the universal. This is this is where the postmodern critique becomes very powerful. So that you, that move to the universal of all lives matter, when those who are saying it are usually white lives. So you don't you're not going to say white lives matter unless you want to be identified with you know skinheads or you know that kind of thing. So you say all lives matter, right? When they say that, they're not necessarily talking about a group of individual alls that make that up, they're talking about their particular group. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So there's a thing where, you know, from the Black Lives Matter perspective, you could say, you know something? That's true. But you have particular lives as well right. as all. I mean, so it's just sometimes sometimes it's just a language and, and mm -hmm. but we're not talking about, you know, parsing out language. That, we're talking about political action that groups take, okay? I mean, to me, it's sad that the people are so, uh, they lack the empathy to understand that there were things going on, instances like we see today that's now the world <coughs> in an uproar that happened when Black Lives Matter first started that birthed that particular movement. Okay, there's a lack of, of like this empathy that people have. And this is where, you know, the problem of race and racism comes in. I'm not saying those who say all lives matter are necessarily racist. What I'm saying is that there's something about the way that particular groups of people hold on to the legacy of race and racism such that they want to keep black folks under the foot. They want to uh, not make sure that black folks are not getting over. This is why uni UBI, universal um, um, basic income. Basic income. Basic income. Yeah. I mean, they've done empirical studies. It's really, you know, race is, is the health care. How many Western countries have more available health care? It's, there's race all up in that. So when yeah. we deal with this race bullshit and move be and help move beyond it, partly by integrating it, partly by healing from the trauma, and then becoming wider in our scope of care and concern, and from a cognitive perspective integral, then we can say, oh my goodness, uh, all lives matter. Let's say if we do it from a national perspective, all Americans matter. So therefore, let's have policies and take actions that will benefit all Americans. Yeah. You know? Yep. It's not it's, it's not so much logic as as being people being political and frankly being tribal. So yeah. it gets back to our analysis of, of ethnocentrism. Yeah, Michael Zimmerman just made a comment. He says, uh, the all lives is a bypass. The person mm -hmm. saying it has not moved through the other's pain to reach the larger identity. And it's ironic, as you're talking, Greg, I mean, it's pretty ironic that the right is trying to use universal sounding language <laughs> in order to prevent a universal conversation from taking place. Oh, Meanwhile, yeah. the left is using ethnocentric language, <laughs> you know, black lives matter in hopes of generating a more universal conversation. So we can see how so much of this is kind of getting, you know, lost in translation. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. <laughs>